Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful. I greet you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome you to our program, Contemporary Issues, in which we continue to look at certain uh, Islamic issues which have come under the spotlight of world attention, where some practices, some beliefs, you know, are questioned by Western civilization, uh, uh, really pointing out that these things are irrelevant and not uh, logical or they, you know, go against modern thinking, etc., etc. And unfortunately, some Muslims have, have igno in, in ignorance fallen into these traps and have become uh, deluded uh, by the arguments which have been presented. So we tried to look at some of the issues and try to understand them. Uh, some of the issues are issues where both Muslims and non-Muslims alike really don't understand why. Why does Islam take a position on this or that? And we hope to try to clarify these issues in our program. In this segment, um, we're looking at, we'll, we, or we will be looking at, the issue of music from the Islamic perspective. Music, which... Uh, most people are aware that you know there is something in Islam re regarding music. You know, uh, to some degree, it appears that it is prohibited outright, or, or some people feel that you know Muslims are okay. Music, uh, in fact, musicians uh, are okay. It's quite popular amongst Muslims, and in fact, even the guitar in Spain was just developed by Muslims when they were in Spain. Now, <clears throat> the actual issue involved here concerning music is that God has created human beings with a nature which loves music. We can see it with a mother singing for her child. Something like this, of course, Islam is not going to prohibit something which is part of the very nature of human beings, to prohibit it just for the sake of prohibition. So, in fact, Islam does not prohibit music outright but it prohibits the harmful aspects of it. Music is, is accepted within a particular framework, but outside that framework it has been forbidden. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited the use of wind and stringed musical instruments. In a very famous hadith in which he said, there will be people of my nation who will legalize fornication, the wearing of silk for men, the drinking of wine, and the use of musical instruments. This is a hadith which is recorded by Imam al-Bukhari. It is a very authentic hadith. Furthermore, he said that some people from my nation will drink wine calling it by another name. Merriment will be made for them by the playing of musical instruments and the singing of adult female singers. This is also an authentic hadith which indicates the prohibition of the use of musical instruments in general, as well as that of f adult female singers. Now, folk songs, which, which are sung by females who are non, not adults, uh, this is to a mixed audience, for example, and, or by males, you know, f accompanied by the duff, which is like a small hand drum. This is something which has been made permissible. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged its use in weddings and festivals. And in terms of the recitation of the Qur'an, it is, it is encouraged to be in a melodious voice. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever doesn't sing the Qur'an is not of us. So there, this element of, of music is accepted within the Muslim society, but that is kept within the bounds of certain festivals, festivities, the recitation of the Quran, etc. You know, and it's not, it doesn't become like an, an obsession. It's, the intent is that it does, should not become an obsession in the society because these instruments, etc., they have a tendency to captivate the heart. They captivate the heart in such a way that it becomes the means that people will find solace. When they're down, they turn on the music, you know, and you know, this is where, instead of turning to God, instead of reflecting on God, they get their solace in music. It becomes a substitute. And they become 
attached to it in such a way that you know, uh, you know, it becomes like an addiction. And when we look at the element that produces music in the society, because you know, some people argue, but you know, it helps me to study. Some students will tell me, you know, that I, I study better when I listen to music. You know, and you know, others have a variety of different explanations. The point is that if music were beneficial, then the musicians would demonstrate that benefit in their lives. Where what you see instead is that corruption, some of the most corrupt elements of society are found amongst the musicians. The drugs, the deviations in homosexuality, people, these type of things, and you know, all the corruption that's there, people committing suicide and all this kind of thing, concentrated in the area of the musicians. Why? If this thing that they're producing is so good, then why don't they benefit from it? The reality is that it, in fact, does carry an evil and a dark side, which produces that type of corruption amongst themselves, and in the end ends up you know, corrupting elements of the society. You know, if you listen to the, the songs that are out there, I mean, they're promoting promiscuity and adultery and sin, and it's just loaded in the songs. You know, unfortunately, this is a very corruptive element in the society. The other area of the arts and the, you know, uh, is that of art itself, where Islam, like Judaism, uh, prohibited the use of pictorial representation of living beings. Islam prohibits it. It's in the Mosaic law and it's part of the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, the prophets are maintained. You know, although in reality one may have find, find you know, examples of image making, you know, in the in, in later Muslim states that developed, whether it is in Spain or Mughal India or Safavid Pers Persia or the Ottoman Empire, the reality is that <clears throat> this was something quite severely prohibited according to Islamic law. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said, those receiving the most severe punishment on the Day of Judgment are the image makers. And from the uh, explanations given to us by the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, idolatry began amongst the descendants of Adam through the making of images. The Prophet Sallallahu had said that uh, in the time of Prophet Nuh, there were some righteous individuals who, when they died, Satan came to the people and suggested to them to make statues and name these statues after them to remind them of the goodness of these people. And the people did so, and they placed these statues in the places where they used to gather, you know. And um, in that generation, the people, whenever they saw the statues, it reminded them of the good of those people and it encouraged them to do good. However, when that generation died out, Satan came to a later generation and suggested to them that, in fact, their ancestors, their, <clears throat> their grandparents, etc., were in fact worshipping these idols. And that it was because of their worship that their crops were successful, the rain came and they had you know, good crops, cultivation was, you know, was very uh, healthy, etc. And with that delusion of this... Uh, lies which were promoted at that point in time, people fell into the trap of idolatry. So the issue of, of uh, creation of images of human beings, etc., is forbidden fundamentally because of this. And if we look at those people involved in idol worship throughout the world, the vast majority of the idols which they worship are idols of living beings. You know, few people worship idols of planets or or trees, etc. Most of the idols that we're talking about are living beings. Now, whether it's a human being with an elephant's head, you know, or a monkey's head, or whatever, you know, you know, or it's a fish or a dog or whatever, people worship idols that are made in the form of hum human beings or animals, and so it has been prohibited across the board. Now, some people may say, well, you know, what's the harm? You know, really. You know, um, if what about people making, you know, we've grown out of this, this, this um, idolatry business, you know, but, um, you know, we, we want to make it for the purpose of our own 
enjoyment and entertainment, etc. Well, the reality is that the vast majority of the world, or much of the world, is still involved in idolatry. So it's still alive and well today. And furthermore, what it does is it creates this, this uh, love in the minds of people, <clears throat> so much so that the artists, you know, many times when you speak to artists or you hear artists talking about their works, they will talk about how they're trying to create something greater than life. You know, something greater than life, which embodies something which you can't even find in nature itself. This is their goal. And this is where it's a kind of like of a challenge with the creator. And this is why, you know, one of the statements of the prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, that, you know, on the day of judgment, those who are making the images will be asked to bring life back to their image, images in their challenge to the creator, trying to imitate the creator. Anyway, I mean, if we find a, an art lover, and, we, and, they, and we, they're told that, hey, this museum is burning down. There's a picture of Mona Lisa, Leonardo da Vinci's work, and there's a baby in there. You can only take one out. What are you going to take out? The, person, the art lover will not think twice. He'll say, I'll get the picture of Mona Lisa. We say, but what about the child? We say, they'll say, well, you know, there are many children born in the world. You know, if we lose a child, no big deal. There's other kids being born. But if you lose the Mona Lisa, ha, huh, this is something invaluable. So that work of art takes on an even greater value than human life. This is, this, this is the sad state that those who love images have reached. So <clears throat> from the Islamic perspective, the making of images, you know, along with the production of music, you know, is, has been prohibited in Islam to protect the society from the harm which comes from it. Of course, as I mentioned, the Muslim world today, you know, in, in having deviated away from much of the teachings of Islam, I mean, one might be surprised to hear that. You say, well, why? We, we see images all the time in the society, you know, in our Muslim societies that we've been in, etc. You know, we see, we hear music all the time, you know, these type of things. However, I mean, the principle of understanding Islam is not that Islam is what people do. You know? Islam is not what Muslims do, but what Muslims should do. And to know what they should do, one needs to learn what are, the, in fact, the teachings of Islam. And then after knowing that, then you judge Muslims in accordance with what Islam is. Not to judge Islam according to what Muslims do. The uh, next topic that we'll be looking at uh, is that of modern science and Islam. We know from the tradition which developed in, in Europe where there was a clash between the church and science, where scientists were burnt at the stake, their books were burnt, and, and when their theories seemed to contradict or to challenge the beliefs of the church, which was dominant, the Catholic Church, which was dominant in Europe at the time, science was, there was an attempt to crush science and scientific inquiry, etc., etc. And from that uh, experience, the general understanding in the minds of many is that science and religion don't mix. You know, they're at odds with each other. However, when one comes into the realm of Islam, one finds that, no, this is not the case. Some of the leading scientists were, uh, of the Muslim world were great theologians. They were quite knowledgeable Muslims. In fact, much of the knowledge which spurned the, 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 the Renaissance and the, the, the development of science in the West, it came through Muslim Spain and, and, uh, and Syria and Baghdad, you know, Damascus and Baghdad. This is where the science was preserved during the Dark Ages, which was what was known as the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages in, in Europe. These were the ages of, uh, the golden ages of science in the Muslim world. So Islam is not opposed to science. In fact, from a, on a conceptual level, <clears throat> science involves the discovery of God's laws in his creation. Human beings are not creating anything. They're only discovering these laws and then applying them. Right? God gives them the ability to apply them. So the laws themselves are from whom? From God. So knowledge of science, what is true science, is ultimately from God. 
We're not talking about the theory and the false ideas that are in the minds of some scientists who promote, for example, that this world is without beginning. You know, the atheists among them who deny God's existence, etc. That's this is not scientific. It's, there's no scientific proof. One cannot prove by science God's non-existence. In fact, science points to God's existence rather than to his non-existence. However, we're saying that uh, when we look at the, the issue of scientific fact, we find that in fact it is it's in, in harmony with Islamic teachings. Uh, you find many verses in the Quran which address points and issues which modern science has only just begun to, to find, to, 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 uh, to discover. You know, you find when Islam speaks about the issue of the, uh, the Big Bang, for example, in modern times we talk about the Big Bang or the development of the universe. You can find a verse in the Quran in the 51st chapter, verse 47. You'll find Allah saying, I built the heavens with power, and it is I who am expanding it. In the 21st chapter, verse 31, you find similar statements of the expansion of the uh, universe. You'll also find the movement of the sun mentioned in the Quran, you know, that it's, it has its own cycle, that it's moving, and that it's running to an end, an ending point where the sun will end. You find that in the 36th chapter, verse 38. And you even find mentioned in the Quran that human beings will pass through the heavens, leave the earth and pass into the heavens, you know, going to the moon or whatever. You can find in the 51st chapter, verse 33, Allah saying there, O assembly of jinns and humans, if you can penetrate the regions of the heavens and the earth, then penetrate them. You will not do that except with the authority, the meaning the authority of God. So, I mean, there is plenty, you know, plenty has been written about the Quran and modern science. From the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad we find things which are only recently scientifically uh, discovered based on modern scientific knowledge. So, Islam is not in opposition to science, not science fact, and the use of science for the benefit of human lives, etc. I know we have some sects amongst uh, people, Christians, who, who shun modern science. They will drive around in buggies, they don't use electricity, they'll, you know. Islam is not in this kind of state. No, Islam will use whatever we can find in the society, which is beneficial, scientific principles, technology, using it for the benefit of human beings and their society. This is part of and parcel of living and the right that humans have. Islam has no problem with this at all. But when we come to some of the theories of science, this is where we may find some problems. And one of the biggest problems is that of evolution. A modern scientific theory, though it's presented as a fact, which in fact is in direct opposition to Islamic teachings. And the theory of evolution will be discussed uh, at some length in our coming segment. Uh, and we hope that you will come along to the program with us. You will uh, follow our next program and, and be enlightened with regards to the Islamic position on evolution. As I said, evolutionary theory, not evolutionary fact. The facts which the evolutionists use no one can deny we have bones. These bones represent animals which were here on the earth, which died out. They are ancestors to living animals today. We cannot, no one can deny these things. But how do we interpret these bones? That we will have a look at in our next program. With that, dear viewers, I'd like to thank you for being with us in this segment of our program, Contemporary Issues. You may write in to us. Charger Television, P.O. Box 111, Charger, UAE, if you have some suggestions of contemporary issues you'd like to hear. Otherwise, you may call into the television, or you may email uh, myself at fld3 at hotmail.com if you have certain questions. And we hope to see you in our coming programs. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.